used to, I was going to be a millionaire by the time I was 20. You know, when I was growing up, I was going to be a millionaire by the time I was 20. And I remember getting to 20, and those days, at the end of the 60s, we were kind of having quite a good time, and I thought, well, I'll leave it till I'm 30. And then I got to 30, and I kept putting it off, and I'd got to 40. I wasted all that time that these kids have got today. I was getting up to the age of 40, and I, th I was thinking I was out on that tightrope of life, and I thought, unless I did it now, I'm going to run out of time. You know, I'm going to be a millionaire by the time I'm 39 and a half. And I started looking around at ideas, and eventually I opened Yo Sushi. After I was eating a, in a restaurant, a Japanese man said to me, he said, and he looked at me in that sort of Japanese quizzical way, calm, quiet way, and he said, what you should do, Simon, he said, is a conveyor belt sushi bar with girls in black PVC miniskirts. Well, we never did the miniskirts, and I think that was his way of saying it should be very stylish. But in that moment, that moment he said, I've never heard those four words in a row, conveyor belt sushi bar. And in that moment, I thought to myself, maybe, maybe that's what I'll do when I grow up. <laughs> this little voice up here, and you know, this little voice which commentates on my life was going, look, if that was a good idea, somebody who knew a lot more about restaurants would have done that a long time before you do. And it's the same voice that, you know, wakes you up in the middle of the night at about four o'clock and you're sweating and you're thinking, oh, how am I going to pay my bills and what am I going to do and all of those things. And it ends up going, oh, you're not good enough anyway. You'd never get anything together. And, you know, for me anyway, success hasn't really been about you know, what I do and all these things, it's about my relationship with that voice. That's what's, what's held me back all the way through my life and forced me forward. So I've worked out this technique that I call acting as if to counteract the negative side for me. So instead of saying, I'm going to go out and I'm going to start the world's largest chain of conveyor belt sushi bars and I'm going to call them Yo and that'll be the rock on which I build this brand called Yo and we'll be in Yoganics and Body Yo's and Yo Tells and we'll rival Richard Branson, which my brain goes, no way, you can't even do the washing up in the morning, let alone do that. <laughs> the things that I've always, I remember thinking at the time, I've always noticed about successful people is the thing about successful people is successful people don't go around succeeding all day every hour. Successful people are prepared to walk out and put themselves under pressure to take a risk or make the phone call that they're going to get rejected. So I figured if that's what successful people are doing, I want a bit of that. I'm going to set myself. I was just when I was going through the goal setting, you know, that scary bit where you have to write down what you're going to do then put a date on it, you know what's going on. I thought, well, what I'm going to do is I'm going to set myself daily goals to start off with, and I'll set myself daily goals, I'll set myself six daily goals to go out and, and fail, get rejected by the estate agents or the property men or the bank or the money people, and I'd come home at night when I'd had six failures and I'd punch the air, knowing that only through being able to be rejected could I get to find some success. Now, when I remember picking up the phone, and thinking another failure coming up, phone, and I phoned the number 0131, and it went ring, 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 ring. Edinburgh University, robot department, how can I help you today, sir? You know, and I couldn't believe my luck. <laughs> but if I'd opened at the end of one year, I would have opened a typical Japanese conveyor belt sushi bar, no big deal. And in that second year, all the things happen. I often say to people that we're so obsessed with getting to market as quickly as we can, sometimes we need to spend more time so that when we open in my 60s vernacular, we've got a wow. You know, in that second restaurant, that first restaurant, I had the conveyor belt, I had automated water machines, I had robots that made the sushi. When we opened, people said, you've got to see this place, it's got robots that make the sushi. You know, I, had, I, had, I put in call buttons to call the waitress, so when you press, you know, a bit like on the aeroplanes, except these ones actually worked. <laughs> and when you press the buttons, it went, yo, yo! Put in robots, robots to serve the drinks, you know, robots to serve the drinks. And then, uh, you know, there's got to be a bit of what I call the ziz the ziz in showbiz to make your idea exciting to people. I put in, we put in a, a basement bar which had self-serve beer. I had singing waitresses. We did massage in the bar. You know, if we'd been a big company, we would have said, you can't do massage in a bar, you know. We'd have had a committee meeting. 
You know, you go out here in this park or any park in the world, you won't find a statue to a committee. You know. And, um, and I did, anyway, how much closer can you get to your customers than to rub oil on their naked shoulders when they're a bit pissed? <laughs> Massage in the bar. And um, I call it, I call it, can I? C-A-N-I question mark. Constant and never-ending innovation. Constant and never-ending innovation. We drive around London delivering our sushi. Um, and, uh, you know, the, I asked them if they could supply them, and the Honda Motorcycles UK said, no, 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 we're not interested in that and all of that. And eventually, somebody did call me back a few weeks later that I'd had a contact with, and he said, you know, you're talking about those Honda Jaro canopies. We got one down in a warehouse in Southampton, was sent over a couple of years ago. If you want to drive it around for six months, we'll lend it to you, but we'd like to just get some feedback on how it works and all of that, you know, low key. And I remember writing to them that night, just instinctively, and saying, Dear Honda Motorcycles UK, I am so grateful to you for lending me this motorbike for six months that I'm going to make you my official sponsor. And if I don't hear back for you in the next seven days, I'll assume you agree. Of course, a big company never wrote back, so I had my three sponsors in place. <laughs> and I was still looking for this money that I was going to try and avoid the private equity people with. And I went to my biggest supplier first, after I'd got a bit from the bank, and I said to my biggest supplier, look, I haven't got the money to pay you, but you can see how well it's doing. Would you just even consider giving me some really extended credit and I'll pay you off over a period of time? And they got quite involved with us and he went away and he said, probably not, but he said, I think we'll think about it, I'll put it to the board. And eventually they called and they said, we'll do that, Simon. We'll agree the terms, it's fine. We've been involved, we'll agree it. And I was, I'll tell you what, I was surprised. I mean, I couldn't believe my luck. I could not believe my luck. I was going to retain 90% of this company. And I asked this guy who had said yes. Several years later, I said, why did you do that? Why did you do that? He said, we had a board meeting. And in the end, we concluded that those Japanese giants who were behind you would never let you go down. So our money was safe <laughs> as houses. 